Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Beyond the Ordinary Show. And y'all, we're in for a very special call today with Denise Manji, who's um, a pet intuitive, but <laughs> that's a very grounded Denise. And even that, you would think that's a little esoteric or a lot for some people. But the wisdom that Denise brings in through the pets, through the animal kingdom, through the part of loved ones and in so many different ways, it's powerful. And it has this force of activating a remembrance within us. And the communication is so supportive of demonstrating not only where we've been, why we've been, or where we are now, and, and the potentiality that we're building towards. It's her insights and her awareness and the way she articulates it is second to none. And so we're going to dive into today's call and we're going to be talking about the earth chakras, what our pets might have to do with that, the animal kingdom perhaps as well, and so much more. And with that, Denise, I know that you are so masterful at leading a way that we can really connect to one another and to ground in. So welcome to the call. And maybe if you want to describe a little bit about your work and what you do and and take us into that um that prayer that'd be wonderful yeah well thank you for having me john it's always so much fun to be with you and this amazing audience every time i come on your show there's always something really exciting and interesting that the animal companions bring together yeah. you know um as you mentioned i I'm an animal communicator, pet intuitive, but there's so much more that comes with that. I think all of us as pet parents, pet groupies, you know, anyone who just loves animals, domesticated or in the wild, we understand the power, the knowledge, the ahas that our animal companions can bring to us. Um, because at the end of the day, there are partners, right? They work with us to open up to new ideas, new energy, new um connections, whether it's on this earth or, or galactic or anywhere in between. So, you know, I started off like so many people just saying, I love pets. What can I do as a career that works with our animal companions? And, you know, bless my heart. I thought I was going to be a dog trainer. And so I started off, you know, thinking very, you know, brick and mortar dog training, maybe a, a doggy daycare. And through the pets, they opened me up to animal communication, which led to numerology, which led to, you know, connecting with different spirit guides and, you know, galactics and all sorts of energy that comes through. And we'll be able to tap into that a little bit with the readings, which is exciting. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what binds us all here for this call is that we're all truth seekers, right? We are all really interested in what is beyond our immediate appearances. What, you know, what else is there in this world, in this universe? What are the mysteries? How can we tap into them and learn a little bit more? And so, you know, the way I want to start is just level setting with, you know, going back to our old friend, Plato, <laughs> the philosopher, Plato. Um, one of the stories that really stuck to me, I think it was, I was about 16 doing summer school at UC San Diego. I convinced my parents that it was a great idea to let me go, you know, spend the summer in San Diego, lay out on the beach and take some poli sci classes. And, um, so one of the first kind of materials that we dived into was Plato's cave allegory. And I think it pertains to all of us here as truth seekers. And Plato's cave allegory is really about illustrating the journey from ignorance to enlightenment, understanding the importance of discernment, and kind of honoring the role that philosopher kings play in helping illuminate truths and move society toward higher awareness. And in Plato's cave allegory, you know, he tells the story of there's a group of people, they're prisoners, and they live in a cave and they've been chained in this cave since birth. And they're only able to see the cave wall in front of them. Behind them, there's a fire. And between the fire and this group of prisoners, people walk back and forth and objects move around. And because the fire's behind them, it casts a shadow on the wall. So the only thing that these chained prisoners are able to see in that cave are the shadows of these figures moving in front of them. And for them, they interpret that to be reality. They don't know anything else. They don't know anything different. 
And so that's the story until one day, one of the prisoners is freed. He's set free from the chains. He gets up, turns around and realizes there's a fire behind. And everything that he thought to be true was actually illusion. It was just shadows of a bigger world outside. And so he ventures beyond the cave. He sees that there's a whole world outside. There's a 3D reality. He has all these new experiences. He, you know, becomes more wise in the ways of the world. He understands what 3D is, not just shadows. And in this path, he becomes enlightened. And that's how he goes from the journey of being the prisoner to a philosopher king. And as a philosopher king, your role is to go back to the cave and try to free the other prisoners. You want to tell them to reconsider their reality, that there's so much more outside there than what they're just staring at at the moment. And some of the prisoners are open to considering it, and others get really angry, and they say, this is our reality. You know, we're, we're not interested. And so in this path from prisoner to philosopher king, there's four acts, right? The first is your imprisonment in the cave. And that's where you have, you know, you're facing this world of shadows, you're not questioning your reality, um, and you just believe there's, you know, what you see is what you get. The second phase is the release from the chains. As a prisoner, you're released from the chains. And in our world, that might be a catalyst event. That might be a dark soul of the night. That might be an aha or an insight, something that gets us to release and see that there's more out there in the world. The third phase is the ascent out of the cave. This is where you leave the cave, you experience the world, you create new perceptions, you understand there's more to reality than meets the eye. And the fourth phase is going back, returning to help others break free. And this is where you inspire change. You inspire people to question their reality. And so I think so many of us have been very excited to listen to philosopher kings. Right, We may not be experiencing life outside the cave, but we're open to those ideas. Our imagination, our energy, our mindsets have soared into different realms, realities, possibilities. And I would argue, and I think you would agree, our pets are some of the most powerful philosopher kings out there. Right, They are the ones who help us have these aha moments, help us see beyond what meets the eye, help us understand our inner terrain through interactions with them. And so what they're inviting us to do is they're acknowledging that we've been in this very receptive state. We've really been taking in concepts. We've been understanding new possibilities. We've been absorbing and receiving a lot of downloads of information. Now they're saying, go back into that cave, unchain your physical experience and put all these ahas into action. And so that's a way to level set and really explain how this call was really inspired by our animal companions, asking us to step into our own mastery, become our own philosopher kings. And the way we do that is putting all the conceptual information, all the modalities we've collected along the way into action so that we can actually transform our lives. Mm, I love that. Oh, that's so beautiful and so appropriate for today's call. And really the tide that I strongly feel that we're all in, that's really we are being called into our own mastery and, and, to, and to finally acknowledge that it does exist. It's not something that we're still chasing. But again, like you said, to put it into practice, to come out and, and, and let that energy and that wisdom breathe to create a new life. And in order to do that, we also have the opportunity and we're being invited to really ground back into the earth, right? Because when we are tapping into these big concepts, big galactic ideas, I mean, even through just, you know, the conversations we've had over the year here on Beyond the Ordinary, we've talked about pets with energetic management. We've talked with pets as teaching us about portals, about shape-shifting our reality, about our galactic heritage. Like we've had these really big picture um, lofty concepts, I'll say, for lack of a better explanation. Now they're saying mastery involves grounding, putting things, um, it, practical everyday applications of it. So this is where the world chakras come in, right? What better way to ground ourselves than to really anchor into the energetic centers of this earth? Whereas before, so many of us were 
you know, going up and out, thinking of expansion as up and out, you know, far away, we're ask, being asked to ground it. And this is so important because of course, you know, there's the um, earth, the world has chakras, just like we have seven major chakras and we know our animal companions have seven major chakras and they reflect each other. Our earth, our planet also has seven major chakras. And these are really beautiful vortices of energy. They are, I almost think of them as reservoir of different frequencies and vibrations that help with the same themes that are associated with each of our human chakras. So our pets have kind of explained this resonance to us. You know, they've, they've talked about the different themes, the different ways to tap into them, different locations where they are on earth. So we're given the opportunity to raise our frequency by anchoring into them. It's that old, you know, metaphor of like the rubber band, right? If we don't expand and go out, if we don't remain grounded, then we don't have, we're not taught enough to have high frequency vibrations. So the more we can remain grounded, but also expand, the higher our frequency and vibration is going to be. And that's truly the invitation that's that's at hand right now. So I wanna go through the seven chakras of the world. So everybody has concept for that. And then also how our pets are guiding us, leading us to that. It's how are they communicating with us? I, I get the invitation, but how can we be conscious and be, um, And be creative and and kind of follow a pathway that's truly set out for us. Because what I've seen a lot of times is that, again, in the work that we do, there's so many different, it's infinite. How many different ways can we get there? And it's it's one, it's been wonderful to explore and kind of feel all the different streams. But I'm with you. It's like we're really being called into that anchoring and to following that path that's really been laid out for us to to have a container so that we can finally become rather than than testing what we might be able to become absolutely so we'll go over the seven chakras of the world and the different themes um we'll talk about the balance that they can bring to our lives and then we'll talk about what our animal companions are calling common sense spirituality which is a way to really kind of bring it all together in a way that's super um applicable in all our lives um yeah go ahead sorry no wonderful so we're gonna go there i know that you're gonna take us into a grounding experience which i want to get into and just right before we get into that y'all april put the link for the special offer in the chat box please uh the special offer y'all it's there's so many great things about it um but there's also the opportunity as well which is my favorite um, to have a one-on-one -on -one session with Denise because those sessions, the, the intimacy and what what gets shown to you that is available that you have access to is it's again truly extraordinary. So if you want to sign up for the special offer right away, if you want to book your session, just the links in the chat box. We'll go through it a little bit in later in detail because there's other components there that you're going to want to participate in as well. Um, but in the meantime, before we go through that thoroughly, uh, Denise, why don't we go ahead and start, if you would, uh, with this process. Absolutely. So the world has seven major chakras and they reflect the same kind of themes and energies that our seven major chakras represent, which are also mirrored in our animal companions. So bottom line is whether it's humans, pets, or the world, we all have seven major chakras and they all correspond and they're linked. Now, the reason why this is so important, why the chakras are coming up so strongly once again, as we're asked to ground is in order to step into mastery, it's all about a balance between masculine and feminine. You know, we talked a lot about this, um, you know, this phase where we were exploring big concepts, kind of lofty concepts. That was a phase of receptivity. Right. That was more, it felt more like feminine energy, right? We're receiving. Now we're being called to step into more masculine energy to balance that. Because in order to achieve mastery, whether it's in our own lives or working with our animal companions, we need to have balance. It's a balance between listening and speaking, between contemplating and acting, between giving and receiving, between directing and leading. 
And, you know, we've done a lot of the feminine, the listening, receiving, but now it's time to take action. And this is where understanding the resonance of each of the chakras helps us do that. Because we each get to build a relationship with the chakras. But in my experience, um, the way I've kind of built a relationship with them, to me, the first, third, fifth, and seventh chakras, those feel more masculine. And we'll talk about the themes so that we have more context, but I just want to set this up. Um, because the first, third, fifth, and seventh chakras, they're more about putting our own energy into the world. It's about grounding, sending our, our um, grounding cords into the earth. It's about creating, it's about speaking, it's about affecting change. Whereas the second, fourth, and sixth chakras feel a bit more feminine to me. The energy is more about um, receptivity and more inward focused. It's about um, nurturing, generating compassion, perceiving the world around us. So we're kind of bringing more input into ourselves. So even as we're talking about the chakras and the themes, we can even start sensing in for our own discernment and our own personal experience, which we feel drawn to. We can start personifying them, which feels more masculine, more feminine. We can attach different associations with them. Um, so we really want to build that rich, deep connection with the earth chakras, because when we do, we better understand our own chakras and our pet chakras, and we can move through the energy. So when we look at the earth chakras, the first chakra is Mount Shasta. And that's this beautiful mountain that's located in Shasta in California. And if anyone's ever visited, it's such a beautiful, um, strong grounding energy. And the first chakra of the earth represented by Mount Shasta is all about, you know, it's the foundation of the planet's energy. So it's all about, you know, safety, stability, connection, and just feeling grounded. The second chakra of the world is Lake Titicaca. And that is between Bolivia and Peru. And that second chakra of the world, just like our own second chakra, is all about creativity, passion, balance, um, you know, gestating, kind of creating and nurturing. The third chakra of the world is Uluru, which is also known as Ayers Rock. And this is this beautiful mountain that just kind of gushes out of the, the middle of Australia. Um, and this third, uh, third chakra represented by Uluru is all about personal power, self-esteem, willpower, that fire. Think of, you know, how we, we think of um, Australia and that fiery, hot desert energy. The fourth chakra is located in Glastonbury, which also is, is thought uh, to be where Avalon was. And I love that for the fourth chakra, because to me, the story of you know Avalon and Guinevere and King Arthur and Lancelot was all about choosing. Are you gonna choose with the heart or the mind? So I love that the fourth chakra of the world is in such a heart expansive place like Glastonbury in England. And it's all about love, compassion, relationships, and intimacy. The fifth chakra of the world is located in Mount of Olives, and this is located in Jerusalem. And so the fifth chakra of the world, just like our own chakra, is all about communication, self-expression, standing in your convictions, authenticity. And it's so appropriate for that area of the world, because think about how passionate people are about their beliefs in that place. Think about all the, you know, different religions and how their uh, main figures kind of cross path in those areas and did sermons and teachings and claimed their beliefs. So there's something so powerful about that Mount of Olives as the fifth chakra and being our voice, our truth, our authentic convictions. The sixth chakra of the world, and this is interesting, is kind of roaming. And it roams kind of around that North Pole and it moves. And I find this so fascinating because the sixth chakra of the world, just like our chakra, is all about intuition, inner vision, uh, perception, insight. And that's always something that's a bit nebulous. You can never really nail it down. So it's kind of appropriate that the sixth chakra of the world is a bit more traveling and, and uh, fluid in that way. And then the seventh chakra of the world, this is the crown chakra, right? This is has all to do with spiritual connection, transcendence, enlightenment. It's located at this fascinating mountain called Mount Kailash, and it's in Tibet. 
And so this mountain has so much mystery, so much um, tradition and lore, and people aren't allowed to climb it. And there's all these um, beliefs about what this mountain is and is it otherworldly? So there's something really mystical and expansive about the seventh chakra of the world. And even just going deeper into that one, um, I found it so interesting to just tap into and explore. So each of the earth chakras have a location assigned to it that kind of holds that energy. It's a reservoir for the energy that's associated with the themes of each. And this allows us to tap into that energy. And before we talk about how our pets play a role in this, I just want to pause and see if you want to add anything or if you have, have any direction you want to take the conversation. No, I think it's wonderful. I was counting to see which ones I've been to, which ones I haven't, how they relate to the masculine and feminine within me, uh, but also the awareness that we don't necessarily have to be in those places physically all the time. We can tap in, uh, but, but this is so resonant for me as well because it's a project that I've been that has been in my heart for the last 10 years is finally taken root and it has to do with this and, and the depth of the intelligence that is there that when met with a resonant vibration really can unlock worlds within us but it's again we've been assimilating and acclimating with the different tools and processes and our own spiritual growth to to get to that place not just as individuals but as a collective as well so I love that you're leading this. I love the awareness that you're bringing in. I love that you're connected to the pets of it as well. Um, and how empowering it is at this time. And it's so, I love what you said also about, we don't have to be there or have visit there to tap into the energy of it. You know, we know energy knows no boundaries. Right. So us learning about it, looking at pictures online, just kind of feeling in, meditating, imagining ourselves being in this spot. That's enough for us to really feel the energy because it's all about the energetic essence. Right. And the energetic resonance. And so that's where our pets come in. Um, you know, so many of us on these calls, I've been talking about it for years, but even pet parents who are new to, to my work or any other people's work, they know that our pets pick up on our energy. Right. And so if our energy can be reflected in the resonance of Mount Shasta, for example, if I'm having issues with, you know, not feeling safe or stable or I'm between jobs, I don't have my footing. I know I can tap into that energy of Mount Shasta, which is all about the energy of the first chakra. Those themes are associated with the first chakra. And I can feel more um, a stronger footing. I can feel more grounded. I can just think of Mount Shasta and bring that energy in. Mount Shasta has the resonance of our first chakra. The same way that Mount Shasta is reflecting the themes of my first chakra, our pet's behavior reflects the themes of our chakras. So I know um, through the work I've done with pets, if my animal companion is, for example, having unleashed reactivity or resource guarding, I've done the work and I have a whole process called translating beyond behavior which maps common pet behaviors with the energy and themes of each of our chakras. So if my dog is having unleashed reactivity or resource guarding, then I know that's issues with the first chakra. They're reflecting that maybe in my life, I need to look at where I might not feel grounded. And I know that Mount Shasta can assist with that. So if I'm unleashed, next time I'm unleashed with my dog, I'm gonna call in the energy of Mount Shasta and really tap into that. So each of these um, locations, each of the earth chakras has a pet behavior that corresponds to it. So if my dog has separation anxiety, I know I wanna lean into late Titicaca. If my dog is barking, nipping, jumping, having these unwanted behaviors, I know I'm going, going straight to Uluru for support. Um, so through the special offer, we kind of map out what pet's behavior kind of points back to the different world chakra so that we can work on that theme. Um, and it's, you know, the microcosm is reflected in the outer world. So if I need work on my first chakra, my pet might reflect that through their behavior. And I might have the opportunity to tap into the energy of somewhere in the world that really is resonant with that. And I think through readings, we'll get a chance to kind of play with this a little more, but I just want to leave that nugget out there. We'll play with that and we'll get into some live Q&A and readings y'all in a little bit. So if you want to ask your questions, get a reading, raise your hand and we'll get into that in, in just a little bit. 
Um, how are the pets tapping into that? How are they communicating that they're tapping into that? So this has been something that they've been so magnificent at reflecting to us. You know, just like us, one of the first things that that I understood working with our animal companions and doing the energy work with them is that their energy reflects ours, right? They're, we're on the same team. We're working through the similar themes together. So I, I knew um, through a download that came actually from a lot of Pleiadian energy. Of, of, you know, I, I think I've told the story on here before, but, you know, I'd been doing a lot of work with pets, with their humans. I was ready to quit dog training because I was like, all I'm doing is bossing around dogs. This sucks. You know, this, this doesn't feel resonant. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I got this huge download about how our pets' behaviors were reflecting themes going on in our own lives, and in particular, charted out via our chakras. So this became less of an esoteric conceptual thing and something that was truly a roadmap, that if your dog is barking, you can just point right back to the chakra on this chart and be like, okay, these are the themes. Where am I seeing these themes playing out in my life? Where am I not using my voice? You know, where am I... Um, you know, where am I not speaking my truth? And so through this process, they've been layering things in slowly but surely. They've showed and revealed that, you know, not only do their chakras and their behavior reflect ours, but our chakras are linked to the seven Palladium stars, right? So we have, you know, our first chakras, if we're having issues or we want to tap into our multidimensionality, we're able to tap into the energy of you know, Alcyone, which in the Palladian star system, the seven sisters, that's a very tranquil, calm energy. So they've mapped all that out. And so they came back in. They're like, hey, remember all that stuff that we layered in? Don't forget about the earth chakras. That pertains to because they really want us to come back. Hmm. Amazing what's coming through. When people are working with this, when clients are, are tuning in in that way, um, how are they grounding in this awareness? Because again, there's so many processes and so many tools. And we talked in the beginning about let's really get into the mastery. Let's, for me, it's like, okay, what's the roadmap really? And let's go on the roadmap because again, if we keep deviating off, we're just distracting ourselves over and over again. That's so true. And so that kind of gets me into exactly what they were saying. They're like, this is all very conceptual and fun. And you have that chart, um, you know, that we've given you that roadmap, the translating beyond behavior, that applies. If you understand the chakra, you and you have information about how that energy of the first chakra is reflected, whether it's in yourself, in your pet, in the stars on earth, you know the theme and you can call on all those energies and resonance. But then they said, but let's not forget, stepping into your mastery is about applying this, getting out of the conceptual, getting out of that big picture, getting out of the esoteric. And that's where they brought in the notion of common sense spirituality. Mm. And common sense spirituality doesn't mean basic. It means foundational. And the, the way they described it, there was a double entendre to this common sense spirituality. They're like, of course, common sense, like it's simple to wrap your head around. But truly common sense, the way they intend it is it's something that we all feel. We all hear it and we all sense it to be true. So, you know, with a lot of pet parents or pet guardians, I might say, you know, our pets are mirrors to our behavior. They mirror our energy. You get a head nod. They're like, I might not have verbalized that. Maybe I didn't know how to explain it, but yeah, I totally get it. That's true. That's right. And now I see that and it changes the way I approach my relationship with our pet. So some other examples of common sense spirituality that they've really been underscoring for us to step into our mastery um, are, you know, there's a couple. The first one was actually, you know, I love pop culture. I love TV. I'm a TV addict. I watch, you know, any and every show. I, and so I've been going back to old shows. And so one that came through was um, I'm watching Friday Night Lights. And I'm not a base a football player from Texas. I'm not a star quarterback. Maybe you have more associations given your time. I have a lot more association with it. I grew up in a place that was basically Friday Night Lights, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when um, the team is getting ready to play, they always get a pep talk and it might be long and it might, you know, be roundabout. But at the end, they always end it with clear eyes, full hearts can't lose. And that's their mantra, clear heart or clear eyes, full hearts can't lose. And the pets kind of highlighted this. I had my, my um, little pet guides kind of tap me on the shoulder and be like that. I was like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm just watching TV. They're like, 
Well, think about it. Clear eyes is you attract that which you focus on, right? Law of attention, keeping that focus. Full hearts. How many, you know, different spiritual practices are all about, you know, following your passion, being in gratitude and really sending that positive energy around what you want to attract. Can't lose. That's how you win. So they're like, rather than talking conceptually about law of attraction and the importance of gratitude, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. I can apply that to my day to day. If I'm feeling down, I can just scream that out and be like, got it. Boom. I'm ready to hit the field. I'm ready to play coach. Put me in. Right. The other common sense spirituality they wanted to share that feels really applicable is it's not personal, but it's about you. And this is a really, really important one because if we are, for example, starting our business, right? And we're like, man, I'm getting no nibbles, no attention. I'm not getting new clients. What is going on? It's very easy for us to go into this place where it's like, well, I, I'm being judged or I'm being punished or I'm being deemed unworthy. But the truth is it's not personal. There's no judgment to it, but it is about you. If you're feeling that way, what, what can you learn? What can you look at differently? Are you in home, not sending out newsletters, not taking action? Because if so, we got to shift that, you know, we have to understand why that's coming through, but we got to shift it. We got to take action. You got to put it out there. Um, if our animal companions are having accidents, it's not about us. They're not doing this to punish us or judge us, but there is a message for us. Um, they might be saying, hey, you know, you're pissed off about something and you're really not facing it. You know, you're not really having that conversation you need to have what's going on. It's not personal, but it's about you. That's a really strong one that they came through. The second one that they brought through that was really helpful and kind of encapsulates this whole philosophy in a really simple way is the solution lay in the problem. And this is really interesting because, um, you know, if your dog is barking, it's not about the barking per se. The solution is voice, sound, barking. How are you using your voice? If your pet is aggressive or overly exuberant meeting new people in the home, okay, if we want to shift that, we first need to understand how do we perceive people entering the home? Are we kind of reticent about it? Are we like, oh man, they're invading my space? Are we not setting up boundaries? Because no matter how much traditional training you do, unless you address the energy behind it, nothing's going to change. You know, if your cat has a virus in their eye, you know, where can you perceive things differently in their life? You know, part of the healing, whether it's emotional, energetic, or physical, is understanding that energy is at the root of any, at everything. And again, it's not personal, but it's about you. There's probably a message in there for you where you can reframe a situation of reality. So these really common sense spirituality, these really simple, you know, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. It's not personal, but it's about you. The solution lay in the problem. These are, are a couple mantras that you can use to apply, um, you know, big nebulous concepts. It distills them in ways that you can really apply in your day to day. I love this. Y'all, if you come back to listen to it, well, come back and listen to the whole replay. And we still got so much more to go, including live Q&A. We've got to go through the special offer. That There's just a lot. But even if you just come back to this and come back to those three mantras and incorporate them in your life, like what's possible with that awareness? What's possible? And I do want to get into live Q&A. Y'all raise your hands, type your questions in the chat box. I'm going to start promoting some of y'all's panelists here in a second. What have you seen shift in your own life and then in the people that you work with's lives when they start incorporating this this awareness of seeing more clearly what's present for them and yeah. and, and finding the solution within the problem? Is it it's beyond it's like, hey, I'm gonna start practicing this and let's see what I can do, and maybe hopefully something by synchronicity shows up. There's an empowerment that actually happens here. That's exactly it. empowerment and mastery, because what happens is now you're not overwhelmed. You understand I have really practical solutions and they're action oriented. They help you kind of see through, you know, the, the story and the narrative and the situation and kind of pinpoint what action needs to be taken. Because I think in the past, especially when we, you know, are more in that feminine receptive downloads, things can be conceptual and interesting but we struggle distilling it into specific action. 
And that's what our animal companions are really inviting us to do through our knowledge of the chakras, the themes, the empowerment to act is they're saying, take steps forward. It's not hard anymore. Um, you know, the zeitgeist is such that, you know, we're in eight, we're in a year of mastery, everything around us, the energy shifting um, for a lot of us who are coming out of, I, I'm not really big on astronomy or I'm not familiar, but I think there was like a 20 year cycle that just ended for a lot of people of like struggle and comprehension into more ease, facility and kind of flow. But we're in a situation in the world right now where so much has changed, even watching Friday Night Lights. That was what, 15 years ago, the world has changed so much. There's so much more at our fingertips in terms of technology, platforms that we can use to connect with people, social media, social media advertising, like ways that we can really connect and put, take action that were not there years ago. So whether it's technology, the energy, our understanding of better um, uh, receiving the message from our animal companions, now we have the tools to really just move forward. Let's do this. We're done receiving, thinking, contemplating. Let's take action. It's so amazing. I love what you're bringing through and I love how you're grounding it in. I want to back up just a little bit though as well, because a lot of times with these seven chakras around the earth, there's these spiritual pilgrimages. We go into connect with higher realms. You go into hold a container, maybe to receive codes, if you will but it gets held in a very upper chakra in our physical body type of awareness and the action taking ability from the lower chakras don't necessarily get activated with the intentionality that we have been taught or guided to or believed that we were supposed to show up at with those sites. Mm -hmm. and and so how, yeah. How do we ground it back in? How can we, how can we anchor it in a place that it really lands in that nexus place where, where heaven does meet or where we can create from that place? And so that's where our animal companions help us, right? Because it's taking action. If mm -hmm. we have a concept or energy out here and we need to pull in and step into action, action is driven by our first, second, third, fourth, fifth chakras. So if we take that knowledge, that energy, and we put it out into the world, we're having it cycle through us. Um, the way they show it so much is, you know, going back to that rubber band, you know, we're in an eight year. And so that's that infinity. That's the kind of moving through that staying in the present. And in the, the special offer, one of the, the first things we ground into is Mount Shasta. And the uh, guided meditation is keeping us in the present through the cardinal directions, knowing that, um, you know, some represent our yesterday, some are tomorrow's. Some, you know, our cardinal directions of north and south, where we've been, where we're going, but it all grounds in the present, embodied right where if we drew an eight over our chakras in the heart, right in the middle. It's, again, this is just so awesome for me. And again, we're going to get to Q&A, y'all, in a second, but I, I just have to continue with this stuff. What, what I'm also aware of is that so many of y'all, myself included, as we've gone through to to refine how we know ourselves, that self-intimacy that I like to, to call it, to really get to know ourselves beyond the conditioned self with fears and belief of, limita of limitations following somebody else's, we'll call it dogma for lack of a better word right now, um, that as we've done this work and we've become more attuned to we he who we are, what we believe is true, our path that we're walking, that part of that grounding in is also taking that spirituality, that high vibrational frequency that you emanate and grounding it in, not just for you to keep in your own temple, but really opening the temple doorways for others to benefit from as well. And that can be a very anchoring grounding mechanism that comes from that throat chakra, if you will, or that solar plexus chakra where you're emanating what you're becoming. Um, and you're demonstrating to others what's possible to help them ground in that truth as well. So and I, it can take on so many forms. It's all about, as they started the call, philosopher king. You're becoming your own master. You're, you're, you're becoming your, philosopher, your own philosopher king. Rather than taking information from others, you're bringing it in and then sharing it with others. You're putting it out there. 
and mm-hmm. everything in the special offer as we focus on those more masculine chakras as I perceive them, it helps us do that. It's about grounding in the present. It's about sacred movement with Uluru. So moving energy through our bodies, through you know yoga, through labyrinth walking, those kind of things. It's working with Mount of Olives where we're standing in our conviction and speaking them. We create a manifesto, we record it, we listen to it to see what our voice sounds like, what our ideas sound like out in the world. Um, with Mount Kalash, with the Kailash, with the um, crown chakra, it's all about enlightenment. We want to understand the steps others took and what their beliefs were, but it's truly about discernment. What is enlightenment to us? It's helpful to have a jumping off point of what others believed, but at the end of the day, we get to adopt or create what makes sense to us. So I love that you're bringing forth this reminder of empowerment, discernment, moving our thoughts, our energy, our downloads, our ideas through our body and out into the world. Hmm. That's what this is all about. Yours. I swear, you're one of the most intelligent speakers that, that ever comes on the show. The way that you distill, put it into examples that we can relate to, help us really activate the clear eyes and, and recognize it, and then walk out with with you know, open hearts, the um, clear eyes, clear eyes, full hearts, can't full hearts, full hearts. I should remember that was like the right episode. This. And the <laughs> irony is. Thank you for saying that. That is so kind. And I, you know, I blush even hearing that. My biggest struggle is the fifth chakra is communication. Physically, I have thyroid issues. You know, communication to me has never come easy. So it's just, you know, I've been working on it. I've been tapping into it. So thank you. Like, that's huge for me. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for being it. So let's get into some readings, y'all. If that some of y'all are promoted panels are going to get there. April. One more time, please put the link for the special offer in the chat box. Chris did it for us. Thank you, Chris. And we're going to get to special offer in a little bit. If y'all want to start opening it up, um, we'll, we'll get there shortly and go through a lot of readings. Um, but let's start the call with Pamela. Pamela, welcome. What is your hey. Question? Hello, Denise. Hi, John. Hi. Good to see you again, Denise. How oh, good to see you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You've been talking to mine already, I know, just by what you said. <laughs> and they're still my delinquents. So uh, yeah. let's not be shy and I'll just bring it out because I've got three large dogs, um, two of them being very aggressive and attacking other dogs, three now. Never had an aggressive dog in my life and it's terrifying. <laughs> And I'm thinking, yeah, I still don't feel safe. You know, I'm still working on that. And boundaries. Sweet Pea's still jumping the fence. So I'm like, I'm going to need a, I'm going to need a reading. I'm going to need a package. <laughs> so, so what's your question, Pamela? Um, can you guide me into the most difficult situations are with my big dogs? Because I can't really... I can't walk them even anymore. And I just gotten to the point where I could walk them together and then they attacked another dog. So I'm afraid to just take them out at all. So can you, you know, I know that's root chakra issues, but can you give me any more insight on to, into that? So this is so fascinating. There's someone, thank you for sharing because, you know, you're not alone, especially with big dogs and you know, it, it becomes a situation where as, you know, women, maybe we're not as physically strong as, you know, someone else might be. So this is a concern I work with with a lot of female pet parents. So I'm so happy you're bringing this up. Um, <laughs> what they're showing in particular is, of course, you're uh, connecting in with Mount Shasta, connecting with the energy of Mount Shasta. But what really comes through, and I want you to imagine yourself in that space, is the quiet I've been fortunate enough to go to Mount Shasta and I walked up there and even not that high up in the mountain, it was an eerie quiet. It was a profound quiet. It was almost like a a galactic quiet, like something that you imagine in the universe. It's comforting, it's beautiful, but everything's out. You are so present in the moment. So what the pups are showing me is that when you're going on those walks with them, they, they have a circle and then they have lines. And you're thinking about the past, you're thinking about what's going on, you're thinking about what's for dinner, you're mm-hmm. thinking about what you did, what you didn't, what was said. <laughs> There's like, it's almost like a circle with a bunch of rays out like sun. That's where your energy is going. It's going out. 
So what mm -hmm. they want you to do is work on the quietude of your mind uh, mm -hmm. because they're going to respond to that. When your mind gets scattered, your awareness gets scattered, that's when they attack because they're like, you know what? This is, she's not fully present right now. So working on creating that presence and beyond just the walks with them, carving out time at night or in the morning, actually they're saying both, <laughs> if you really want to know, probably <laughs> today if possible, where you just tap into this quietude. It's almost like um, sense of probation. So think of yourself in a sense of probation uh, capsule where it's just like perfect that's exactly and it's not at all what i imagined but it's the action steps that i need so that's fabulous and so doing this outside of walks is going to help with walks because it's a muscle to build you know this ability to kind of get into that state and even when you're walking as we discussed before call in mount shasta call in the energy the spirit the essence of mount shasta Picture yourself in that mountain, surrounded by that mountain at the base, with the base of the mountain around you, you create an energetic circle around you and the pups. And that also reminds me, by the way, the energetic circle, remember with Albert, yeah. got to get back to that too. Working with people in, in circles. That's exactly what I thought. And I have not been back to that. And I have been wondering lately what that was about. That's perfect. You still have those recordings. If not, I'll I'll dig them up. But you know those that we did a few years ago with Albert. Mm -hmm. Gotta go yes, back. that's wonderful, Pamela. Perfect. Enjoy your enjoy your session also and and the package. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. That's wonderful. great. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see here. We have um. China Joy Ananda. China Joy. Thank you for writing in. Um, my beloved feline companion Ginger has developed hyperesthesia. How might that be a reflection of my energy and how can I diffuse the frenzy she feels to get at whatever is plaguing her back like a freaky itch she can't scratch? Hmm. Okay, so uh, can you read that last part again? Because I don't know what hyper... Hyperesthesia. Hyper, E-S-T-H-E-S-I-A. Hyperesthesia. She describes it a little bit that she's going, she's trying to get on her back. How might that be a reflection of my energy? And how can I diffuse the frenzy she feels to get whatever is plaguing her back? So something's plaguing her back. Like there's a freaky itch that she can't scratch. Okay, perfect. So I'm not a medical intuitive. I'll, I'll just kind of start there. But what comes through, um, let me just do something real quick on the numerology. Okay. So our little ginger, when I pull the numerology of her name, she has, wow, she, it's seven, nine, five, seven, five, nine. Seven is a really kind of spiritual number. It's all about kind of um, working through having, having um, faith in moments of crisis and moments of crisis can be when our animal companions are working through something physical, like a disease or, you know, whatever her condition may be. So that's something that she's bringing through for you to work through. Also, in these moments of crisis, it's going to be an opportunity for us to learn more about our skills. So one thing she's showing is you moving the energy around her body, um, you know, at night or, or, you know, morning, you know, find some time where you can actually use your hands to move energy over her body. Um, almost like you are wiping off leaves on a bench, you know, just kind of clearing the energy there. And then Miss Ginger, with that 95, when I see those numbers side by side, she's a tremendous healer, right? 95 is a big healer number for our animal companions. And they're able to heal from inside out. So they're able to kind of put healing vibrations out into the world. But she also has the 59. Um, that's about the um, empathic healer. That's the healer who brings energy inside her body, transmutes it, and then puts out clean energy, like a, like a Brita filter. So you moving the energy for her is going to help. And what I would recommend is now it's going to be all about sacred movement, moving through the energy, shifting the energy, moving along. So the energy shifts through her body. So tap into the third chakra of the world, Mount Uluru. And in the special offer, we have some doga poses that you can do, which is partnership doggy yoga poses. 
We talk about labyrinth walking and a labyrinth can be, you know, stones set up in your garden or, you know, a, a just walking circles within your living room. Or if you're in New York City, like I was for so many years, you can use a finger labyrinth, which is a print out of a labyrinth that you draw your path through setting the intention of the motion. Um, so focus in on that third chakra, which is represented in the world's chakras by Mount Uluru. Oh, wonderful. It's so good. Now we're going to take some more callers. I want to get into the special offer. We've mentioned that a lot. The link has been in the chat box. I hope you all have opened it up. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to work with Denise in multiple ways. And again, I cannot recommend her work enough, uh, truly. So um Again, the links in the chat box will pop in there one more time, I'm sure here, because the team is awesome. Um, but y'all click on that. And Denise, if you'll guide everybody through three options for the offers, that's possible. Perfect. So I don't see it popping up on screen, so I'm going to do it from memory, but I it, it's pretty uh, recent in I, my head. I can pop it up, though. <laughs> okay, so perfect. Give me a second and I'll find it here. Great. So in true invitation of our animal companions for us to become our own philosopher kings, what this um, this package provides, package A, is going to be all about, you know, the world chakras and our pets and unleashing our mastery through both. It is um, a 30 page PDF that has links to different guided meditations and a doga video um, and just a few different activities for you to do. But in true invitation for us to step into our own um, mastery and become our own philosopher, philosopher kings, there's overview on the chakras. And it's an invitation of if there's any that are more interesting to you, the invitation is for you to go deeper, do your own research, do your own connection. But the information provided is enough to really kind of get you started. And in this package, you know, we're focusing on what I perceive to be the masculine chakras, because to John's point, we're really trying to dig in and kind of create action. We don't want to be in that feminine receptive anymore. We really want to work through the masculine aspects um, through the support of the first, third, fifth, and seventh chakras. So the first module, um, which is going to be in the PDF, is all about Mount Shasta and grounding into the present. So we're going to be talking about Mount Shasta. We're going to be talking about the themes of the first chakra, the different mindsets that are represented by them. We talk about your pet's behavior that reflects an invitation and prompts you to really kind of tap into uh, Mount Shasta a little more deeply, which is on leash reactivity, which we, we touched upon with Pamela a little bit. And there's a guided meditation that kind of brings you back into the present moment. Um, and there's also a, an aspect in this module about discernment in our body and how to trust it. Because as we step into our mastery and we become philosopher kings, discernment and understanding that is so important. The next module we talk about is Uluru, and this is all about sacred movement. So again, um, for Australia's First Nations people, Uluru is this beautiful mountain that is very sacred. And visitors are allowed to come and walk around it. And as you walk around it, you experience the energy, you take these steps. It's all about kind of the spiritual union between the earth, the sky, and all those who, who um, have, have benefited from this beautiful fiery third chakra energy. And with this one, the activity is going to be a doggy yoga, which you can do with a dog, a cat, or any animal companion. I walk you through a set of poses uh, you have a cheat sheet for the poses. And I will say, I'm not a yogi. I'm not a yoga instructor. So for me, it was about the fun of this new kind of movement. Um, so if you are a yoga instructor, you probably, your form, your technique is a lot better. But again, it's that invitation to play, explore. And if it's something you like, go deeper. Who knows? You might decide that you want to be a yoga instructor and, and do yoga for others. Um, and then also with this one is uh, an intro module about labyrinth walking, the significance of it, and an activity for you to do it yourself. Again, it's all about sacred movement. Mm -hmm. The next module is the fifth chakra represented by Mount of Olives. And it's about speaking what you believe, speaking your convictions. So we go into Mount of Olives, um, the themes it represents, some of the mindsets, what your pet's behavior kind of reflected by um, the energy of the fifth chakra. And with this one, we have a guided meditation to find your authentic voice. And there's also a note about word choice, right? Because when we're trying to get clear on what we truly believe, word choice is everything. 
um, with a background in advertising, we used to say love, um, health, and um, happy. Those are the three no-nos because those are such big words. There's love, but there's compassion. There's motherly love. There's companionship. There's nurturance. There's so many deeper ways for us to go deeper into the resonance of words. We want to get clear on it. So I threw that into the module two for consideration. Next, we have, this is the final module, and it's all about Tibet and seeking higher ground through ancient connections. So with this one, we go into, and we understand a little bit about uh, Mount Kailash, about its history, its background, the themes that it represents um, being associated with the, the crown or, or seventh chakra, the pet behaviors that are linked with it. And in this one, it's really interesting. Mount Kailash, Kailash is known as many as Stairway to Heaven. So my original thought was I'm going to do a meditation or a journey that takes us all up the Stairway to Heaven. As I went to do it, I got such a big X. And this to me was fascinating um, because it became my first relationship with this mountain where we had a little bit of a back and forth. And they're like, number one, if you go up, you're not going to want to come back. Number two, it's too personal of a, an experience. There's certain things that you do alone. It's like being born or transitioning into the next realm. This is not for you to do and provide to a group of people. It's something that they can do on their own if they'd like. So instead, I got the calling to um, provide a guided journey that um, helps us align to our higher self. So we step into the crystalline version of ourselves. Um, and in this module, we also have a little section about enlightenment, what others thought enlightenment to be and, you know, prompting us to really revisit that, but then decide for ourselves what enlightenment means. So that is package A and um, yeah. Well, Denise, for package A and for any of this, do we have to have a pet companion in order to benefit from these modules? Great question. Absolutely not. Our, you know, we all have chakras. These are all universal themes that they deal with. So if we are human, if we are red blooded and we're breathing, we're good. This pertains to us. All right. So that's it. And there's a bonus in here. There is. So um, before you go into the modules, there's a whole little setup about, you know, digging into the chakras and their universal themes, just so we kind of ground everybody in that information. We go into the pet chakras and where their chakras are. We go into the earth chakras. Um, you're also invited to join our um, group live oracle card reading where we all get together and we pull cards for each other and we do little meetings for readings for everyone who's in the group. And then, yeah, there's an extra bonus, which is a pre-launch sneak of select chapters from my new book, which I have right here, translating. Um, Amazing, yes. And that's launching this Sunday. So I'm I'm so excited. It's something I've been working for seven plus years on. And it's finally time, you know, according to the pets, time to take action. It was I can only time. imagine what is in that book right now. It just feels so just rich. Knowing the way that you teach and the way that you synthesize everything, it's just going to be amazing. So Thanks. that's epic. Well, the package is epic, knowing the way that you create everything. So... That's wonderful. Y'all, that's package A. That's $97. Um, now we go to package B, which is everything in package A plus a 30-minute intuitive reading. That's right. And so, you know, I always like to level set that different animal um, communicators get different sorts of information. Some get, I like this toy. Others get a lot of medical stuff. Um, what comes through for me mostly is what's going on in the human's life through the lens of the pet. Because if we understand how they see us, our mindsets, our habits, anything that needs to change or be reinforced, we vibe higher and so can they. Um, and of course, you don't have to have a pet to have this reading. Um, you know, most people come to me do, but I've worked with a lot of people who don't. And we me talk to everything to <laughs> life purpose, um, galactic connections, sometimes other humans that have crossed over pop in. So it's really the messages that are ready to come through for you will. Hmm, amazing oh that's like again so that includes everything in package a y'all plus the 30 minute session and that is 149 dollars two payment option on that as well and package c yeah so this is everything in package a everything in package b which is the reading plus um, a full course bundle on training your pet so this is for the pet parent 
who wants to go deeper in with the actual positive reinforcement training, we're able to bring in, um, you know, everything from setting your puppy or your dog of any age up for success, teaching the basic obedience commands, working on, you know, anything from independence training and separation anxiety, managing unwanted behaviors, benevolent leadership, housebreaking issues, it has it all plus the energetic considerations when we're dealing with any of those common behaviors with our pets. So this give you, gives you the hands-on training with the energetic considerations. And it's how-to videos, so you're able to kind of follow along um, with the PDS, with write-ups, and it's, it's kind of everything you need to set your pup up for success or get back on track with an existing animal companion. Amazing, amazing. So y'all are going through package C includes everything, all of it. That's 249. So package A, B, or C. Um, it's amazing. This is so generous of you, Denise. Thank you for offering this. Again, what? I'm going to have my session with you soon, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and I wish you all sessions with Denise as well and that intimate time and that connection and connecting to the chakras in this way. It's just up. It's up in the field. I've been guided to it very strongly. He popped it up here as part of a special offer from DTO. So again, the synchronicities are just, um, they're just truth tellers for me. They're revealing what's available to us. So thank you for bringing in that consciousness and for grounding it in uh, so that we can put our mastery into action. So wonderful. Uh, all right, y'all, hopefully you're taking advantage of the special offer. If not, at least keep the link open if you're going to sign up a little bit later and get on the calendar link so you can schedule your session sooner than later. Um, and Denise, with that, can we dive into some more Q&A? Love that, yeah. All right, so let's continue. Barb, let's go to you now. Welcome to the call. Thanks, honey. Um, I uh, I wanted to ask, it. I got permission from a friend of mine that I, she lives in Stratford, Ontario, and I live in St. Mary's, Ontario. She is a dog. Sunny is his name, S-O-N-N-Y. Her name is Judy. And uh, she he is a rescued dog from Korea. He, uh, he was flown over from a, a volunteer group that rescued him. He was a street dog. And... Uh, she got him December 20th. Now, uh, he has a, a lot of issues. Um, he uh, he has separation anxiety. He's not as keen on going up to men. Um, he's very, very shy and, and fearful. Um, doesn't like to walk in her neighborhood on the sidewalk, cars, other dogs coming around. He She comes over to my town uh, has a big uh, river walkway by the river so there's much wider area and he can move over if there's another dog and it's not as busy so he's a little better walking but uh, and he doesn't he whines in the car all the time and uh, and he itches he, he he had this in Korea apparently they think he's about two or three years old uh, he's a small dog Beagle and Dachshund, they think he might have. He was with his mother on the streets, the mother dog, and uh, she went into a fo both were in the same foster home, and then she died about three weeks before he came over to Canada. So, yes. Well, thank you to to you for representing your friend, and thank you to your friend for opening her heart and home to a rescue. I've done a lot of work with rescue pets, both as you know, with training and, and kind of running nonprofits. So yes. it is so beautiful that you open your heart and home to to sweet Sunny. Yes. And thank you for distilling that so clearly, what's going on with our little friend here. A couple of things. I pulled the numerology on Sunny's name. And yes. overall, his numerology is 24 over six. And when I see pets with the numerology of six in their names, home and their family is their life so it makes okay. sense that he has that separation anxiety it makes sense that the outside world is not something he seems very interested in because for him if he had his druthers he'd be yeah. with his mom all the time yeah. That, yeah. That, that moment so one thing that as pet parents i would always recommend is 
sometimes we try to kind of, um, we think they'd have a more dynamic or balanced life if, they're, if we're taking them out, if they could go to dog parks, if they could play with other dogs. Mm -hmm. That might not be the case, so let's honor his little energy. Also, he's incredibly sensitive. Within the yes. middle of the day, he has 65, which is 11, six plus five is 11, which is very energetically attuned, very kind of um, psychic, very attuned to the energy. Mm -hmm. And then 55, when we have amplified five energy like that in the form of 55, it's incredibly sensitive. Five is the number of all senses, right? Feeling mm -hmm. everything, everything coming into your body, very empathic. So mm -hmm. he's just wired to be this really sensitive little being. A yeah. lot of scratching a lot of times can be that it's just there's so much input the only way he knows how to process it is like letting it come through the skin so there can be itchiness hmm. there can be a little bit of um you know boils or stuff like that for the separation anxiety um we also we want to tap tap into the energy of lake titicaca the second mm -hmm. of the world we want that nurturance we want the flow of emotions. We want to let him know, we understand this is hard for you, little one, but you're going to be okay. We're going to work through this together. I see you. I hear you. I flow with you. That's going to be really important because all too often, we don't acknowledge their emotions before we try to change the behavior. So have your friend sit down with them and have a conversation. What happened with your mom? How was that trip over? That might have been difficult for you. Show me tell me, let me sit with you through it. And then we'll be able to let it go. Um, with rescues, a lot of times it's helpful to have that level set conversation, then let it go. They just need to be heard. Um, for the fearful, the aspect of man, uh, you know, dealing with that masculine energy, first chakra, right? So we got Mount Shasta coming back into the, the picture for us to kind of leverage into that strength. And as your friend Judy works with these more masculine chakras, as I interpret them, she's going to ramp up her masculine energy that will complement this beautiful divine feminine energy that she has. And as she exudes more masculine energy in that balance, he'll have more comfort around the other masculine energy outside of the home or, you know, other, other men coming into the life. So I would say focus on the second chakra, the first chakra. So Lake Titicaca, um, Mount Shasta, and then Uluru is always great. Movement, motion. Um, the third chakra also helps a lot with skin issues and feeling comfortable in your own skin. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I, I'll say uh, he was actually, the foster home called him Sony, but it didn't feel right for Judy and didn't feel right to me either. And she changed it to Sunny. Oh, that's really sweet. I love the vibration of a name, right? It's powerful. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Beautiful. Thank you, love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we had a comment that came in. I think it's really wonderful. Um, and I'd love for you to address it. So Aaron writes, in my humble opinion, you need to work through the history of the animal, just like with people. And a lot of the behaviors or pets are emitting are a result of the human behavior interacting with the animal. Absolutely. I agree. And how does this work help to bring that to, to the forefront so that we can become, because like psychotherapy is amazing and counseling is amazing and all these other therapies and, and they all have their place. And a lot of times when there's a, a direct route rather than roundabout ways, then why not take that route? But it's, again, there's value in so much and truth in everything, right? Absolutely. And I, I love what she says, and I could not agree more. And the beauty of working through these issues side by side alongside our animal companions is, you know, we're working through the same themes that we're, you know, affecting the same chakras. They just, you know, one's manifesting in a pet behavior, the other one might be playing out in my career, but the energetic essence is the same. So the beauty of having this partnership is as we work through it, it's not so much conceptual in our head, like psych, you know, like working with a therapist might be, we actually have to take action because we're working with our pets to shift their behavior. And then they become a litmus test of how we're moving through it. They're the dress rehearsal. If I need to set better boundaries at work, I need to learn to set boundaries with my pet. Solid dress rehearsal, I can master it there. And then it translates to other areas in my life. So I love what you said. I agree with it. And I think 
when we're able to collaborate with our pets, it's more actionable and we can see progress in real time. We have real time feedback. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you Aaron, for your comments and for allowing us to elaborate on that. Let's continue now. How about we go to Maria? Welcome to the call. What is your question for Denise? Hello, hello. Nice to see you both. And congratulations, Denise, for your book. Um, so my animals have been very uh, agitated and very, very active. Not only the ones that live with me, but also some around me. They want to come into my house. But I'm mainly concerned to with both, with two of them father and son, my gray ones, um, they they are having problems with, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this in English, but it's like doing wee-wee everywhere and everything that has to do with wee-wee. Okay. Don't know. <laughs> and so it's Hafa and Mel, you know, Denise, do, do you remember? They are um, father and son. And well, I find it interesting because it's both of them having the same symptoms. So it seems like it's quite strong, something. On that, they're fazendo xixi pela casa. She's from Portugal. Yes, yes, they do. Yeah, it's two o'clock in the morning, but I wanted to be here with you. <laughs> okay, so Hafa and Mel, they're they're um, eliminating inappropriate having accidents around the house. Um, so interesting, Hafa's got that six energy, Mel's got the four, five, three. so. What they're inviting you to do, and this is going to be a really interesting one, this is going to be six chakra issues. When we have issues around our animal companions that are having accidents, there's always a component of the six chakra. And so that in the earth is a roaming chakra, meaning it's a moving target, which is interesting because what they're asking you to do between Hatha and Mel is to feel into each moment what is truly at the root of this. On sometimes it's going to be about this is mine. This is my territory. I'm protecting. I'm marking my territory. On other times, it's going to be I'm clearing the energy, and this is the only way I know how to release it. So when it comes to marking territory, that's going to be the first chakra. That lack, that sense of there's not enough for both of us. This is mine, 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 mine. I'm claiming it. When it comes to I'm clearing the house, there's a lot of energy going on with the eclipse, with you know what's going on with everyone else. I'm trying to keep everyone safe. I'm moving through the energy. I'm releasing it. That's the sixth chakra. That's going to be how can you help clear the energy better? How can you be more attuned to what's going on with the other animals and help those animals? Because they're helping those animals move through their energy. Okay. So it's going to be a little bit about when is it about, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I don't think there's enough, this is this is mine, I'm going to claim it all and have it all and eat it all and make sure it's mine, versus I need help, I'm working with the energy of the animals, and I need help clearing the space. And so for you, between Hapa and Mel, it's going to be interesting for you to kind of feel in and discern the difference. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Then I'll be with you in a session. <laughs> so, oh, amazing. But awesome. I wanted to send love to all. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Maria. Boa noite. Boa noite. Boa noite. Boa noite, yes, good night. Um, awesome, so good. So Denise, Maria reminded me, and I want to ask you this. It's like, what is your awareness of the effects that our pets were possibly could have been feeling during this eclipse? So... A lot of animal companions, just like us, some are more sensitive than others. Um, you know, there are some animal companions and some pets that I work with. Every time there's a new moon, they have accidents or they have separation anxiety episodes. Um, and what I tell pet parents is if your animal companion is acting out, start journaling when it is and start journaling what's going on with the lunar cycles, with big events like portals, equinox, eclipse. And observe, because some animal companions, not a problem. Some, they get really tired or they get really needy or they have accidents. Regardless, we want to make sure that they have plenty of water. We're getting them good exercise. And we're just mindful of how they're feeling in the moment. But just like humans, it varies animal to animal in my experience. I love that. 
they're not picking up on something esoteric that we're not picking up. They're not seeing beyond the veils going, oh my God, something's going to happen or the satellites are going to fall out of the sky. It's just that they're having their own personal experience. And with those some of them are more sensitive to the environment, just like us. You know, when it rains, for example, the barometric, barometric pressure drops and they're attuned to their environment and they feel it. You know, that's yeah. why, you know, cows go under trees or, you know, some animals run to the, the eye of the tornado. It's just their instincts and their connection. Um, but when it comes to domestic animal companions, they've lost a little of that, you know, true connection to the earth sometimes. And it varies pet to pet. Wonderful. I love that. I love the answers to that. Thank you so much. We're gonna, I'm going to choose someone else here in a second, but I want to ask a personal question because it's, again, I don't have a pet companion in my house. I'm surrounded by nature with geckos and cats and birds all over the place. I was going into a very deep connection that was coming through and I knew it was going to be deep. And the second I started going, I can feel the energy building up. I've got this glass enclosure that I'm in and two birds just slam into my window. And, and they, again, because of the windows, we have the little sticky things that go in the windows so they can see the reflection so they don't go into them. But I knew there was a message there and I didn't quite know what it was. And I'm wondering what you tune into. Yeah, so that's really so beautiful because what they were reminding you of is as you were going into that and you knew it was going to be deep, there was a little boy part of you that was like, maybe that's too deep. Maybe I should set a limit. Almost like when you go into the deep end of the pool, it's like, well, I'll stay in the shallow end then because I'm kind of scared about what's, on, you know, what if there's sharks at the deep end of the pool? I think as kids, we all kind of thought that might be the yeah. case. So you were setting a little, the little boy in you, that aspect was setting a little bit of a glass ceiling up and they came in to be like, knock that down. You don't need that. To remind oh, wow. you. Yeah. And it was profound. It's, it did help. I was like, oh, curious. Yeah. Um, it gave you the opportunity to kind of restart with a, a different perspective. Amazing. Thank you for that. Y'all, this is so good. I can't wait for my reading. Um, okay, let's continue. Jennifer, let's go to you. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. So I lost my Miss Mabel cat about two weeks ago. I had just come home from a trip, had left her in, in I thought, capable hands of other people. And she became very ill and died 24 hours later. I am still just in shock and uh, unhappy. Anything that you might be able to tell me about that? First of all, our heart I mean, we're holding you in our heart. I'm so sorry. Anytime we have to say goodbye, it's shocking. It's sad. Even we know our energy, you know, lives on in our connection. As humans, we just want to hug them. So we miss them. So I'm so sorry Thank that you. you're no longer here physically. Um, what she's showing, um, okay. So what she's showing is that it was her time to go. That was going to be part of the agreement. And she didn't want you to have to go through the different steps. So that's why it was so fast. It wasn't anything that was done as lack of care. It wasn't anything that was preventable. It was her exit strategy and it was meant to be quick. She says the person you had um, in charge while you were gone was loving, kind, and honored the process. So it was the, you know, it, it was a, a person who understood what was going on um, and was able to kind of allow the process to unfold and not add too much of their own emotion into it, but really kind of hold that space. The parallel they're drawing is the same way as, you know, we had this eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked into a lot of different spiritual traditions of what to do during an eclipse, what different people do. And the one that resonated with me most was a Native American um, belief and tradition of when there's a solar eclipse like that, especially in totality, go indoors and be solemn and honoring and grateful, allowing the sun to go through that death and rebirth on its own. It's like we're holding space for the sun rather than connecting with the sun and manifesting and, and being part of the action. It was more about holding space for the eclipse to take, um, to take place. That's what she's talking about with her transition. This person was able to just kind of hold that space and allow what was to unfold to unfold. Um, this is something that she's inviting you to connect with um, the seventh chakra, Mount Kailash. And, you know, we talked a little bit about that stairway to heaven. This is an invitation for you to go 
along with her on the stairway to heaven and have the conversation as you go up those steps. Why? Why now? What do I need to learn? I'm so grateful, you know, reminisce on your connection together, but there's something there for you to, um, and there's something that's very sacred there for you guys to go through this process together. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's never easy for them to go, especially when they're young. Um, I know that's the same with people. I do understand people that lose their children. And you know, our four leggeds are like our children. So um, you, you just stand in shock for two weeks. You just can't believe it. So right. you're saying there's nothing you could have done. Like, don't, you know, no coulda, shoulda, would us. There's right. It was, it was it, it was the time. And this is for you to walk up that stairway with her and have that conversation. And even, you know, something that, that pops up a little bit is um, the Tibetan book of the dead um, mm -hmm. rituals and practice. And maybe take a peek at that and see if anything resonates, but um, it's that she's really bringing about that Beth death is the rebirth. And they don't always say this, but she will be back. She comes back in a mm -hmm. different body there was something in this body that just wasn't running smoothly and it was time to upgrade or switch so she will come back but she's inviting you for this walk that's interesting because i keep feeling like i hear her say i'll be i'll be back mm -hmm. i'm coming back so it's like okay and i have read the tibetan book of the dead so that's an amazing anybody can get the audio especially if you can get a monk reading it for you amazing so that's beautiful validation that you've heard her. She walked, you know, she knows the beautiful validation that you're hearing her clearly. Uh, thank you. That thank was you. wonderful. Thank you very much, Denise. I appreciate it. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, blessings to you. My condolences. Thank you, John. It's it's really beautiful. I've been I've been tuning into my father and my mother a lot lately. Um, that they've been coming through and Again, that mastery that's coming through that I'm realizing a little more within myself than I knew yesterday or the day before. Um, and I'm reminded of the legacy of love that was given to me, really, from the love perspective, from like the way that I really was, like the way that they really showed up. And so much forgiveness work, but really seeing them more in their light and seeing the intentionality and and taking what was given to me and then how can I again lead with that how can I amplify that love what am I doing with that legacy and that invitation and and I understand that, that legacy is me being of service but truly in that I can't help but to be the receiver and the giver of it the amp as in becoming the amplification of it I have to admit it and benefit from it and how beautiful for any of us who have lost dear ones in our lives in whatever ways uh, to be reminded of how blessed we have been and, and what do we do with the truth that wherever love was given it can never be taken away it can only be augmented and all we have to do is choose to do so nothing else nothing else so anyway Jennifer, blessings to you. It reminded me of that night, and I wanted to share. Um, Y'all, the special offer of Denise, the chakra centers, these places around the earth, how they're mirroring back to us what's possible in the grounding in and walking really forward in that mastery. Um, the private session for the pet owners to go deeper into that training, and if Denise is doing the training, you know, it's just like so spot on, practicable, practical effective, fun, um, and it's Denise. I mean, come on. So again, the special offer is in the chat box. Y'all take advantage of that. I'll congratulate you on the book in a little bit more. But before I before I get into gushing about you and your book, um, what is it bringing you the most joy right now in the work that you're doing, Denise? Honestly, it's being able to do it. I went through a lot of different phases in my life where there was something that, you know, I knew was missing. I mean, I talk about this, I've talked about it a few times. I remember when I first had my aha, my first kind of unshackling of the, the chains as the prisoner in the cave and waking up to the spiritual world. I remember listening to your podcast and being like, 
these conversations, these are amazing. If one day I could be on a platform like this or have these conversations, I can't, you know, it'd be so amazing. So having this community, being able to live this life and talk about these principles and being so honored that the Animal Companions trusted me with some of this information. Um, you know, I truly believe everything that I've shared on your show throughout the years, everything in this book, this isn't from me. This is something that's been entrusted for me to share and impart. That's why work on the fifth chakra has been so uh, meaningful in my life. So for me, it's the joy of being able to put this out into the world, share it with pet parents and have pet parents be like, I totally like that resonates. I, in my heart, I knew that to be true, but I never knew how to put words to it. Wow. And having those connections, that's what really lights me up. It's such an honor and it's what I was hoping for my entire life. Like this was my dream. I lived my dream. Wow. Oh, amazing. You're such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. And your book. Oh my God. Will you hold it up one more time? <laughs> it's so epic. So it's, it's a so proof. Epic. This isn't part of it, but we've got a little puppy and yeah, I mean, it's just got everything about um, our energetic connection with our animal companions using shared motivation with, um, you know, our our pyramid of human needs, the chakras, pets' behaviors, how they all come together. But this is something that was entrusted to me eight years ago on an equinox, and it took seven years to get it written and out in the world. And I truly think it's because we're ready. You know, the it's part of the zeitgeist now. We've taken time to really evaluate what's important to us. Um, so many of us have adopted pets, you know, over the reset period in 2020. It's just, I think, you know, people are ready. And to your point, John, when we were talking earlier, not only our spiritual community, because we've always been at the forefront of this, but the exciting part is so many more people are, are thirsting for this information. And each and every one of us here, we get to share this knowledge, share the learnings, if I'm doing it through pets, you might be doing it through, you know, another modality, another kind of belief system, but there's so many people who are now receptive. And that's why our animal companions are really asking us to step into these philosopher kings, step into our mastery, because so many more people are ready to hear this. Maybe it wasn't so 15 years ago, but now we have the technology, the audience, and people desire this information. And I do think the the planet the energy of the planet where we've come as humanity is supporting this information as well we're in a beautiful point of human mm -hmm. evolution and we get to have these conversations we get to have these conversations but i love 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 that we're having conversations that are really emerging from our passion your book is a passion your book it's like it's so you and so you're calling it's just it's just so aligned and that you're giving voice to it in in a way that you're expressing more freely than you have before, that you've honed, again, the, the mastery of you not convoluting your message for the sake of acquiescing to something else, but from the integrity of you. It's, for me, it's just, it's it's so in alignment what we're all being called to. What is that truth that is in alignment with our hearts, with our voice, our creative expression that the world is ready to hear that Ah, that the world so frankly is just like thirsting to hear such truth so I clearly from that, that whole heart the whole heart i think that you know going back to the clear eyes full hearts can't lose right um it's about the passion and you've always brought passion to your platform and all the speakers you invite are passionate about their topics and especially with, you know, things feeling a little wonky every so often in our day to day, bringing that passion helps counterbalance it. Right. So all of us, and, and I think this is something I had to learn the hard way was we don't have to wait until things are perfect to put it out into the world. Um, so if you're feeling called to, if you have a passion to share, sing it, shout it from the mouth, yes. share it, write it. There's so many people who are open to receiving. Dance it, write poetry about it. Just do it. Just and y'all don't need to see. I'm not a do like I'm not a yoga instructor, but I was like, you know what? I'm not going to judge myself. I'm going to put these poses and this flow together. It not might not be perfect, but it might inspire someone to go deeper or have fun with it. So, um, you know that that perfectionism is so you know 
2016. We're going to let go of that. <laughs> just put that into the world. Imperfections, the new black, y'all. Wear it. Wear it. <laughs> Lovingly. And with your authority. So wonderful. Denise, you're epic. So grateful that you just share in the way you do. So grateful that I, you come on to lead on Beyond the Ordinary as you do. And just so grateful to call you a friend. It's always a blessing to be with you. Aw, oh, thank you, John. This is, you know, a dream come true. All these conversations that we get to have. And I just want to thank everybody who's coming in and bringing their energy, sharing their pets, and just being part of this. We are mm -hmm. part of the new vanguard in life, but also in pet guardianship. And um, we get to lead the way and show the true full role that our animal companions play in our lives. And we can be that philosopher king for them. Um, yes. They're encouraging us to step into it. So John, thank you. Thank you for, for being you and everything you bring here oh. to us. You help us grow and expand and you do so beautifully. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you, each and every one of you bowing in namaste. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next call. Bye, everybody. Bye, Denise.